So, Danny, how are you doing this week? How was how's Scotland? How's Glasgow? How's everything? Bonjour. <laughs> yep. Okay. Sa- is, is, you've va? been colonised by the French. <laughs> oh, oh, that. Oh, yeah. I forgot this isn't learning French with the Scotsman podcast. Oh, is that your your side podcast? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Ah, okay. Everyone, see what I just did there? I applied humour to start the podcast just to ease us in. And <laughs> don't fantastic, worry. Fantastic. Yeah. Don't, don't worry. I won't be doing it again. Okay. From oh, now I've on. got a book. I've got a book just on the on. side of me that says um, <laughs> "Comedy for Dummies," so I'm ready with the with all my French. I'm ready for that. Wow, wow! You you, you just took my joke, put it down the toilet, and flushed it unceremoniously. There. That's my entire job in life. My goodness! How are you, Lewis? How's it? Uh, I'm fantastic. Hobbiton? Yeah, Hobbiton is fantastic. Uh, everybody has hairy feet. Um, yep. It's all good. The Shire is good. Excellent, excellent. Uh, for those that are not in on this incredibly niche, very, very specific joke, <laughs> um, many, many years ago, Simon Lowe, who is an actor that we've worked with for years, is a very good friend of ours, uh, asked me and Danny where we're from, and Danny said, oh, I'm from Glasgow, because he is, and I said, I'm from the Staffordshire Moorlands, because I am. And Simon went, no, you're not, that place doesn't exist. <laughs> and for years after that, he referred to me living in the Shire, or... Just any any place that didn't really exist. So that was always a good time. Yeah, yeah. And the and the way you get into the Staffordshire Moorlands is there's a little hole that everyone has to go through, like you know, like Alice in Wonderland. You all line up <laughs> and have to have to climb into this hole. <laughs> That's what happens on the train when I go home every week. Is I I get on the train and then the train has to approach the tree. The driver gets out. He knocks on. He's he does a bit of that. He knocks on. And he says, hello, may I enter the Shire, please? And then the Lord Mayor of uh, wherever I am says, yeah, right, mate, come the in. Lo- <laughs> the Lord Mayor, so so you've got, you know, you've got some high up people barring your entry to the to the Shire then. <laughs> yeah, you do. Yeah, it's, um, it's yeah. like, do you know what it's like? It's like Gibraltar. That's what it's like. Um, I'm not familiar with the current political situation in Bro- Gibraltar, so I'm not very comfortable commenting on it. There's a there's a border at Gibraltar, and there's a border at the Staffordshire Moorlands. Oh, okay. So yep. it's like, um, okay. So it's like Washington, D.C. It's exactly. like non-state territory. It's like, it's like, uh, the Vatican for Great Britain. Ah, okay. But, yeah, the Staffordshire Moorlands less, is a city-state. Yeah, but less luxurious. <laughs> And, and more, more creepy. <laughs> oh yes, the creepiest, exclusively the creepiest. Yeah, the that's creepiest, how I do everything. Is creepily the creepiest city state on the planet. Yeah, definitely. I've heard uh, many good things about. Um, well, it, it's it's the uh, state newspaper that's issued to everybody's drawer at, at the break of dawn in the Staffordshire Moorlands is um, creepy. Creepy. <laughs> it's it's like. Um, Welcome say Empire, to which is about film, TV, but uh, no, creepy. That's yep. all about um, being a massive creep. <laughs> Welcome to creepy news. <laughs> yeah, and just like that. That's what that's what the newsreaders say on our yep. local news when it says, um, "And now for the news where you are." Welcome to creepy news. And 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 the news when he says news is just held a little bit too long, and it's like <laughs> news. <laughs> Like you that. said a little bit too long, and then you proceeded to make the worst sound I've ever heard in my entire <laughs> life. <laughs> so how have you felt in the past, um, it's been just over a week since we've released the first episode of, of, of um, our podcast? Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't I haven't looked at the stats, but I assume that, you know, we're going to be signed up with uh, all the major podcasts like Joe Rogan and... Uh, H three H three, yeah, uh, definitely. Hello, ca- internet. Yeah, yeah. So mm. well, um, good news, Danny. I've just had an email come in from um, the Glasgow Tourist Board. <laughs> they think that you're so superb as a podcaster that they'd like to offer us ten million pounds in a sponsorship deal. Wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you can get a new mic then, Lewis. <laughs> I can. <laughs> I can. It's very exciting. <laughs> Have you had any feedback on the, on the podcast? Have you had anybody kicking off at you in the street? Anybody spitting directly into your face as you've been going to the shops? Well, I mean, I get that anyway, but look. <laughs> Did you request it? <laughs> yeah, I pay people to do that for me. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, mate, here's a fiver. Spit in my face, gonna. Yeah. That's that telly money. Yeah, 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 exactly. You've got one of those those money guns. You'd fire it out in the street and say, anybody that catches one of these fifty pound notes, come and spit in my face. Every everyone in Scotland who's listened to the podcast <laughs> have said, "What's that English one saying? I can't understand him." <laughs> <laughs> they think you've got horrible diction, Lewis. I do have horrible diction. This is the truth. <laughs> Yeah, so wait, should, we, should we talk about what we're meant to talk about now? Well, I do have a bit of follow-up, actually. Oh, oh God. All oh, right, okay, sorry. You better yep. brace yourself for this one. Uh-huh. Um, Simon Lowe, friend of the show, is... Um, friend of the show? <laughs> I only said that because it rhymed. I thought it was hilariously fantastic. You make him sound like a sort of, uh, a sort of producer who's got like, no power whatsoever. He's a friend of the show, you know. Well, he's he's looking at me here from from he's sat I'm sat in the recording booth and he's sat threateningly in the next room over yeah. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. Simon listened to it. Simon uh, had a bit of a chat with me the next day and he said um, he was quite surprised that we didn't talk about what how the film Ex Machina would have been different if um, it hadn't have been somebody that Caleb wanted to be with if it had been instead like I don't know Judy Dench playing his nan or something. That's a good point. But yeah, like, it is. You know, Simon's pretty good at, at f- things, and we just we just rambled about um, <laughs> nonsense for an hour, and yes, then the... and then we made fun of the helicopter pilot for for not realizing that a lone woman has left without anything on her, and just <laughs> yeah, I'll take you home, hen. Come on, hen. I'll take you home. That's all right. Come on, yeah, hen. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the, I think that's going to be the overarching theme of this podcast is a lack of. Um, Structure, substance. a lack of substance. Yeah, we're just going to talk <laughs> no- nonsense, absolute nonsense. I mean, I've got my notes open in a tab here. I am using a mouse this week, so loads of clicking and scrolling. Get rid wow. of all that ASMR goodness. See, I'm, um, I'm more of I'm more of a an old school kind of guy. I've 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 wrote to my notes down. Good lord, I have yeah, nearly so. finished my notebook, so I've had to order a new one off Amazon. And before that arrives, I'm being very frugal with the pages that I use in my notebook. See how how could you have like, ran out so quickly? Do you know? Do you want to know my notes for Ex Machina when we did this last week? Yep, yep, go on. Robot bad. <laughs> that's, <Uh-oh>. that's it. <laughs> that's some good notes there, man. No, I um, I have been using this notebook since like 2016 or something idiotic like that. Yeah, well, I mean, what 2016, and you've just filled it. You can't be kicking off saying, hey, um, uh, actually. You, you, why is it taking you so long to fill up this notebook and also say, yeah, you filled up this notebook dead quick? Yeah, well, I d- I, I, funnily enough, I don't know your spending habits, Lewis, so I don't know <laughs> when you got the notebook. <laughs> I just assumed that you got it for this podcast because I bought one for the podcast. Hey, up thought, now, Danny. We aren't all made of money. <laughs> this is your gilt I notebook, say, is it? It's, it's, yeah, in, well, it's I, painted with gold leaf. Yeah, I say... I say bought a notebook I got some leaves and stapled them together and started writing it with my own blood but, uh, oh, no. <laughs> that's how we do it in the Shire yeah <laughs> one one quick one quick thing before we actually do what we're meant to we're ten minutes in uh, you know you know how we're talking about the Shire May- maybe yes right, yes this is just a, a wild theory of mine right oh okay I'm prepared for this hang on hang on I've got okay. I've got my mug oh, of tea okay, in my hands ready, now. Ready to spill it. I'm firmly it. ready to have a have a relaxing ready sip. Ready to spill it. Um, yeah. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> right? In the Lord of the Rings, <clears throat> Frodo's journey was just a massive drug trip. Yeah. Because all the hobbits, right, are like smoking weed, like constantly. Mhm. Mhm. Like, cause the <laughs> do we know it's you see, weed you, and not like tobacco or something? Well, well, exa- well, we're never really told. Ah, and, well, well. The hobbits are always so happy and l- relaxed. Mm, so mm. maybe they're all, they all just smoke weed constantly. They maybe might. It's been That's very true. In the Shire. It might have been legalized. Maybe J.R.R. Tolkien was a proponent of legalizing marijuana. We just don't know. I mean, I doubt. I doubt. I doubt it. To be honest. Oh no, Danny! I've just had another email come in. We're being sued for slander by the estate of J.R.R. Tolkien. Oh, oh no! Again, Christopher Christopher Tolkien is gonna is gonna um, sue us. He he wrote he wrote a couple of books after uh, his his dad passed. Oh yeah, any good? 
haven't read them. Oh, uh, <laughs> a glowing so, so, review then. Do you know, it's like, it's like when a restaurant uh, changes uh, companies, it's like, no, I'm not going in there. It's gone downhill. It's changed hands. It's changed. <laughs> yeah, that chippy on the corner, it's changed hands. I'm not going in there, you know. It's changed hands. It's changed hands. It's not going in. Oh my god. Gone downhill. <laughs> it's all village going downhill. Times are hard. <laughs> You, you can't leave your front door open anymore. You remember when you could leave your front door open when you had nothing worth to nick? Oh god, I'd forgotten about that. <laughs> oh my god. Do, do you think we could, Alec? Do you think we could sell the oil for money? Do you think so for money? We don't think so, no. <laughs> this is such this is such incredible niche friendship references to things that you jokes you've made many, many years yeah. ago that nobody listening is going to get. <laughs> It's fine, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, that's just what people listen to, is us Sh- being weird. <laughs> should we should we, should we, try and uh, talk about the film now? Uh, well, uh, we're 13 minutes in, so I think that's a good place to start, yeah. And then let's yeah. let's blast through about three minutes of film chat, and then we'll get right back to being weird. Yeah, fantastic. Exactly, lovely. Okay, good stuff. Um, <laughs> I, have <laughs> I have many fewer notes for this than I did for Ex Machina. Um, and I watched all of it apart from the last ten minutes because I went to make a cup of tea and then forgot the film. Wow. <laughs> wow. So si- Simon will no doubt have some notes for us after this as well. Watch the film, guys. <laughs> Come on, guys. Watch the film. <laughs> um, um, okay, let's, I'm going to have so my, my first note. Are you ready for this? Do, do they know which... Do they know what the film is? Oh no, we don't. <gasps> Fantastic. Because we didn't announce it, did we? No, we didn't. At the end. Um, okay. Well, this film is The Social Network, which is yes. um, a 2010 film. Yep. It, it starring stars Jesse Eisenberg. Jesse Eisenberg. Yep, uh, Justin Timberlake, Andrew Garfield, um, and a whole bunch of other people that I'm too ignorant to know the names <clears> of. Yep. And it was directed by David Fincher, mm-hmm. written by Aaron Sorkin and Ben. Mez Mezvich, Mezvich. Yeah, Mezrich. Yeah. Mez Mezvich. Well, my my first note on this film is Aaron Sorkin's dialogue is proper good in it. <laughs> it always it always is though. I love Aaron Sorkin. It writing. is. It's fantastic. He's done so much stuff, and it's also good. I'm gonna Google him real quick. Aaron Sorkin. <laughs> because I know he's done this, and I'm fairly he's, sure he did Steve Jobs done, as well. He's done so much. Let me just Google him and see what he's did. Because <laughs> yes, that was it. I knew because I just wanted to make sure he's done Steve Jobs, which is another one of my favourite films. Um, yeah. And the I remember thinking the dialogue in that was absolutely amazing when he's talking to like his daughter, when he's talking to like his colleagues. It, it's all really good. Social Network, Steve Jobs, loads of stuff. Done The West Wing, which I've never seen, but it's meant to be very good. Nah, I never, I never saw it either. He left like, after season. Uh, Four, I believe. Maybe, maybe. And then I think it went downhill after that. I don't mm. know. I I can't know. You you can't know. I can't. It's against the law, Lewis. It's forbidden knowledge. Yeah, exactly. I see. Um, so I think that it's important to separate uh, the real person from the character. Mhm. Because I think that if if the film was about you know. Well, we've invented a new um, uh, light bulb. I think it could be the same. I think the film would still work. I don't think it's about Facebook. No, I don't think it's about Facebook either. <coughs> it's about the conflict that um, that Mark Zuckerberg, the character in this film, has between him and his friends and his colleagues and his people he went yep. to college with and stuff like that. Yep. I think it's. I think it's an incredibly good character study yeah yeah, yeah definitely I, the, I think the first the first scene is my absolute favourite where he's sitting with uh, Erica that is a very good one yeah and like within the first couple of lines you know what what his what his motivations are mm mm and he's like how do you distinguish yourself from people who like, who have all got 1600 in their SATs so immediately you know that he wants to separate himself from the crowd. He wants to be better than everyone else, yeah. Exactly. And his ego is incredibly fragile. Mm, mm. Now, um, uh, yet more Lewis Brindley talks about cameras. Um, there's, in that first scene, Erica says to him, 
Um, you can go through your whole life thinking that um, girls don't like you because you're a nerd, but that's not the case. It'll be because you're an asshole. Yeah. And in that one moment, her face completely fills the frame. And I think that's like it, it's went to represent one of those moments that's like, oh, he's going to remember that forever. Do you know what I mean? One of those memories yeah. that you just are incapable of forgetting. It's something he carries with him forever. Mm-hmm. And it, it clearly does because look, there are a few points um, <clears throat> in the film where he tries to reconnect with her. Yes, at um, is it the sushi restaurant? Yep. Yeah. And and at the end, after you know the court. Uh, or the the deposition. Sorry, he uh, he's on Facebook and he's like, friended her. Mm, mm. So, I mean, let's see. Throughout the entire film, he doesn't really have like a human conversation with anyone. No, he he just tries to make people do things. That's that. That's, yep. that's his whole character is him making people do things. He doesn't. He was never friends with Eduardo. He doesn't care mm. about Eduardo. The the only conversations that they have is um, the court cases or him asking for money mm. to do things, and then when when he wasn't uh, useful, he just you know cut him out, mm. Mm. which is pretty sad. Yes, it is extremely sad. It made me wonder before Facebook and before Face Mash and all that. Were they actually friends? Did they know each other? Did they chat about, like, stuff? Or w was his entire relationship with Wado and the other guys in that flat, were they all... Was it was it just so he could get things from them? Yeah. I think, I think it probably... It might have even been circumstantial, because I don't know if they chose who they were... Uh, Bunked up know. with. Exactly. No, I don't, um, I don't know as they did, no. But, you know, e even, even if it does, I think, I think Mark just wanted... To to get everything he could out of them. Yeah. And what's interesting is that even though we know that Mark isn't a good person, none of his none of his colleagues or his uh, uh, you know uh, fellow students are good people either. Yeah, you're completely right. There's not really it's, there's not a really a hero or a, or a decent person mm, mm. in the film, which maybe makes it more realistic perhaps it does yeah there's they all sort of uh, speak and do to their own to the beat of their own drum if you will there's not a single one of them is a good person doing redeemable good things although yeah. saying that Wado doesn't really do anything that bad no he doesn't he um the worst thing he does is freeze that bank account that he gave to Mark which is a completely understandable thing to do in that situation oh yeah fair enough but was he? He was. He was. Um, he stood by and watched uh, Mark make the the thing where he objectified uh, face mash. Call yeah, exactly mm. face mash. Yeah. So and he, I don't. I can't. I can't remember whether he found it funny or whether he was like. But he didn't do anything. He said he didn't say Mark, don't do that. Mark Hun. Yeah. Come on, man. Yeah. He did have that one point where he was saying, um, maybe we should stop before we get into trouble, but then that's a very sort of selfish way to yeah, display it's not that. About, yeah, it's not about um, helping the people that Mark's victimising, it's about, I don't want to get into trouble mm, because mm. of your actions. What I found interesting <clears throat> when he was, you know, putting up the rates for these, uh, for these women, it showed you shots of, like, them objectifying themselves... If you know what I mean, like I they were, don't you know, know what you mean. Well, like when when he's putting up a thingy, you, you know, rates for for different women, it cuts to shots of them uh, dancing without without clothes on and being objectified in real life. That's interesting because I viewed that not the other way around because it's not the other way around, but in a different way anyway. I viewed it as like um, it's 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 to show. The the what's the word the disconnection between Mark's idea mm. of fun, which is sort of taking out his frustrations on all these strangers that go, he goes to college with, compared to the sort of I mean I can't, you can't see the air quotes because of the unique nature of a podcast, but to the <laughs> standard like everybody else type thing ha way of having yep. fun of going out and drinking and like partying and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I took it to be to be 
representative of their disconnection from everything. Did you take it to be a, a sort of metaphor for objectification? Well, I mean, I, yeah, but it was it. The, the the stuff that happened in real life was that was it was their own choices. I suppose and that's it, it, yeah. It showed. I think it showed that that everyone in that place at that time is is pretty pretty um uh, artificial. I suppose so. Very, because we, the only character that we really focus on is is Mark, mm, really, mm, mm. and he's pretty and he's pretty emotionless already. He so very much like, is, yeah. I think, I think it's just showing that, yeah, Mark is a is a is a dick, but no one around him is is any better. These people are all exactly the same, but Mark just happens to be smarter. Perhaps, yeah. See, this is the good thing about the the, the layering of of Sorkin's dialogue and Sorkin's the, the the screenplay itself is that it lends itself to everything that they say has several meanings in a strange way, and the way that they say it means something different to the words themselves and all this sort of stuff. See when see when he's he's uh, resetting the the page. I, d- I know you didn't watch the last ten minutes. I have watched it before, so I am aware of the last ten minutes. But go on. All right. Okay. Fair enough. Um. When he's like resetting the page on Facebook, yeah, yeah, to see if Erica has accepted. Do you think that that is him showing remorse, or do no. you think that it's a sort of dark, uh, twisted way of saying he's gonna try and make a relationship with this person, but because of the the artificialness of social media, it's gonna end up amounting to nothing. I don't think that he shows remorse. I don't think he's really very capable of remorse. I think um, he's a very petty person. I think he might have been like wronged in some point in his life, and from that point onwards, he's been a petty person just in general. Yeah. But um, I think that that shows Mark's sort of relentlessness in a strange way. Mm-hmm. If he wants to have a relationship with this girl, even though over many, many times over years and years and years. She said, sorry, no, you're a dick. I don't want to speak with you. I don't want to be with you. I want you to go now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think the entire... It's ever since you briefly mentioned choice a couple of minutes ago. Now it's made me think about the whole film in a different light. About Is it all sort of about choice? In that... Um, like, right, let me think about this. Because I've literally just thought of this. In that um, <laughs> it's, it's Mark's choice to be as as remorseless and to be as as cruel and manipulative as he is he chooses yeah. to manipulate erica into essentially breaking up with him because he decides to he chooses to use certain words and certain phrases to imply that he oh. thinks she's stupid and he chooses to manipulate eduardo entirely for his money and he chooses to uh, form a business relationship with sean parker who, yeah. by the film's account, is not a great guy. No, he's he's um he's almost like a sort of uh, less evolved version of Mark. Like he's all talk, but by the time like you know you try and crack his his uh, exterior, it falls apart immediately. Yeah, yeah, he's um. He has Mark's confidence without Mark's introversion. Yeah. And without Mark's technical sort of skill. Exactly. And Mark is immediately drawn to him as well, mm, mm, which mm. is interesting because when they're sitting at the dinner, <coughs> the dinner, the you know the the restaurant. Yeah. And uh, Ed- Eduardo's saying he's twenty five minutes late, and then they're arguing, and Mark says, uh, "No, Eduardo says um, he's not a god," and Mark says, "What is he then?" And he's like, he's 25 minutes late. It's like, Mark is immediately impressed. And as if to dispute that, he's like, he's not a god. And Mark says, well, what is he then? As if to say, well, I was under the impression that he was. Mm, and we're mm. just... But he's probably just, again, like Eduardo, another means to an end. Yeah. And it's just that and it's just that he's impressed by his, his caveats. And eventually he will be used and thrown aside like Eduardo was. Mm. Which I, 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 
I mean, I have no idea if Sean Parker is still a, far, a part of Facebook, but I I don't think he is. Yeah. But um, that's a very interesting idea about will Sean Parker still be a part of Facebook after Mark seems to have think well I've used up his usefulness now, because yeah. like essentially, as soon as Eduardo is no longer providing money for the company, Mark shuts him down and says no, what well, you're not useful you're not useful anymore and gets rid of him. What's it, so on choice? I think I've I, I sidetracked you there. Sorry. No, it's okay. Um, the big the big idea that you've that you've come up with yeah. the film in a different way. I think ever since you mentioned the choice, I've come up with this idea that it's it's the film's core theme is about choice. It's about choosing to be a good friend, choosing to be a bad friend, choosing to rip off the Winklevoss's idea instead of just making your own thing. Because clearly he's incredibly technically minded. He could put his mind to anything and do anything at all. Yep. And yet he chose to rip off the Winklevoss twins, be- whether it's because they are sort of this stereotypical bully, or whether it's because of the um, the fact that they're rowers. Yeah. And then that first scene of the film, Erica says That's something true. about, um, "I'll date a rower, or I, I would have dated a rower, or something like that." Yeah. And then they, he, he goes on to meet these Winklevoss twins, and they say, "Yeah, we row crew," which makes me think, well. <laughs> May is that the entire reason he hates them? I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it past them. Cause it, it and I think, I think it's deeper than that as well. Mm. I think that in order for Mark to succeed, in his mind, people have to fail. Yeah, like he can't. Yeah. He can't succeed alongside people. Like he must succeed despite uh, the Winkle, the the Winklevoss twins. Yeah, yeah, and the. The only time he he, you know, uh, improves or uh, goes up in the world is by dragging someone else down yeah. or crushing someone else. Mm-hmm. The Winklevoss twins' business partner Divya Narendra. They mm-hmm. he um Mark never shows any kind of animosity towards him. He never really even mentions him. Yeah, it, it's it's entirely the Winklevosses, which I think Mark must have picked them as a sort of scapegoat for all of his hatred towards Erica and the rest of the world and decided to rip them off entirely because they're rowers I mean I would ima- I, I wouldn't I, I think that's probably correct <clears throat> and I, and it's hard to believe that someone could be that petty mm, but mm. because of Sorkin's uh, dialogue it, it makes it seem incredibly plausible that oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. That they're rowers Erica likes rowers and she was joking as well. Yeah, yeah. And she said, "Oh, I'm only joking, but that was it was too late. It was like, you know, you've 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 insulted me. You've insulted mm. my ego. So now I hate roars." It's in his mind now. Yeah, yeah. And maybe the whole venture is a sort of way to impress Erica or the idea of Erica. Yes, because I think um she's she's the one thing that he 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 has been denied. And everything else he gets because you know he's he's you know exceptional, but no, his his complete lack of self awareness mm. has snubbed him of of a person that he may or may not care for. I think he he what you said about the idea of Erica is touching on something brilliant in that I think he Mark this is doesn't understand that he, I think he has completely separated the idea of everybody he knows from the people themselves. He's separated yep. the idea of Sean Parker from the actual Sean Parker, in that he's thinking, well, Sean Parker started Napster when he was in high school, and he did this really cool, amazing thing and ripped off the music industry, but he's separated that from the reality of, he's 25 minutes late, he's incredibly rude to me and my best friend, yeah. he's, he's separated it from the, the good and the bad. And the same with Erica, about, well, Erica was my girlfriend, and then she said she likes rowers. And <laughs> he's, he's choosing yeah. boxes, two boxes for everybody to put each thing in. Oh, you've just, you, Lewis, you've just permeated an idea in my head. Oh, fantastic. We're having some great ideas today. I know. Um, Mark looks at the world as if he's on a computer, as if he's looking at the internet. Hmm. Mark, the, the idea of Sean Parker is that it's, it's as if he's just looked him up. Yeah, that's very that's, true. That's that's the only thing he sees he sees the achievements that he had he doesn't know he doesn't care about the external emotional factors he just 
looks at everything as if he's a search engine. He looks at the figures of the person, yeah. Yep, yeah, and will you be useful? Yes, I'll use you then. And if not, then no. And it's the same with, like, you know, like, sort of social media dating sites. Like, often our words and the way we speak on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook can often be misinterpreted by someone and they'll think that you mean one thing or or something else mm. and not everyone means everything they say yes but Mark because he's just looking through that prism can't really tell and it just it just ruins that mm. first relationship for him mm. and then I think interestingly um, Mark either means d- depending on how you view the character Mark either means everything he says or he means nothing that he says yeah. Either either when he's shouting at um, Eduardo when he's just been waiting in the rain for an hour or whatever it was, he either means completely what he's saying about yeah we need more money or we need or he means nothing that he says and he's just saying yeah yeah I've just woken up I I can't be bothered to talk to you you can just go back to go back to New York I don't want to deal with you. Do you think he means everything he says? I'd like to think so, because that would make the character much more redeemable, but no, I don't think he means everything he says. So you think he means nothing? I think everything, every interaction we see him have with people, it's it's like he's put on a mask and he's just extracting what he needs from that person. Yeah. Doc and Eduardo walks into the dorm room and he says, yeah, I need a new server with a MySQL backend and all this sort of stuff. It's going to cost a bit more money. And that that's the first and only thing he says to him. The only thing that matters it's it's don't get me wrong, I do think we get glimpses at the mark who is genuine, like the bit yeah. where he's waiting outside of um uh, was it the formal that sort of dance thing where they were stood around in the fraternity building, yeah, and they were stood outside, and Eduardo goes back in, and then Mark stood there for a second, and it's like he's taken his mask off, and he's just saying to himself, "Yep, okay, and uh, now I'm gonna go and create Facebook." <laughs> Yep. And um, there's that very, very cool moment where they both go back to the dorm room together, Eduardo and Mark, and Eduardo gets two beers out of the little fridge, one for him and one for Mark, and then Mark comes back and gets one out, one for himself. Mm-hmm. Yep. And it's it's those moments that we get a glimpse through the the sh- the veneer of the genius that made Facebook into the sort of deeply fractured person underneath. Mm-hmm. I think it's um I think it's an incredibly deep character study mm, mm. which 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 is very just it's just credit to Sorkin's writing again I mean it's like all of it is there but everything you need to know about this person is in those words yeah and it's just it's just absolutely excellent yeah definitely do do you think that there's a th- there seems to be a trend nowadays. Well, uh, it may not may may not be as much anymore. But like, there's a trend of like the sort of talented genius, the sort of anti-hero that that's so rich within our culture. You know, you get people like, like Walter White, and you get like, you know like Sherlock and mm, Mark mm. Zuckerberg, and all these all these anti-heroes. What what do you think? Um, is the reason that they're so popular? I think it's because we've gone through a sort of a surge in... I think that up until computers were made, you were sort of prioritised in society by your ability to do something, whether it's to repair a car or do electrical work on a house or do plumbing or whatever. If Your ability to do a trade and to do things is what made you valuable and what made you important. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly with the rise of computers, which is this infinitely complex thing that so few people in the world understand or that's what it's built up to be anyway yeah i think that at that point almost overnight it went from what can you do to what are you capable of doing yeah in the well if you're very very clever then you'll be able to understand this incredibly clever subject that i don't understand because i've been spending my life learning how to fix cars or whatever it might be yeah i think um that's the reason for that is all of a sudden intelligence is valued very very highly 
compared to before. Do you think that's a sign of 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 our culture becoming more cold and uh, and distant? I'm not sure if it is a sign of our culture becoming more cold and distant because. There has been a resurgence in the very, very recent time of it going back the other way as well. A resurgence of um, very niche, independent shops. There's this shop in, in Manchester, a tea shop I go into, which is literally uh, two or three people that work there, and there's always, like, um, one of them has a dog that's always in the corner, and they, met, they blend and sell this tea, and it's really lovely. And yep. that's a very... The entire selling point of the shop, because, I mean, you can go to Tesco or whatever and get... Tesco's value Earl Grey tea for 50p for 800 tea bags or whatever it might be but the entire reason that I want to go to that shop again is because the people are so nice and the, everything about it is a good experience and then you go back how, well, how, how, how much of that is real though? well it's all in my head yeah because they at the end of the day they're doing a job yeah and they they only care but if 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 to be believed that they only care about money then everything they do is is to somewhat you know put on for you for you mm, to sort mm, of spend mm. your money well there is that but i think um I, I was buying some clothes a little while ago and um one of the things that um the the cashier said to me cuz he'd helped me pick out this jacket cuz i wasn't sure which of the two i wanted and um he said, yeah, well, the thing is, mate, people buy from people. Me being genuine and nice to you and saying, no, this doesn't work, but the blue will, or whatever it might have been. Yeah. People saying things like that, that's what makes me want to go to that shop again. That's what makes me want to to, to get into contact. Not Because it's like how you want to see a friend, but even though it is yeah. a very capitalised version of that. Does that make sense? Uh-huh. But, I mean, I feel I feel very like, uncomfortable when I go to shops. Mm. I don't. I don't feel welcome. I don't feel a part of something, and I I prefer ordering online. Okay. And I prefer to sort of take away that human interaction, and I think that that's a trend that has boomed in such a you know huge way mm. recently. And I think that what you're talking about with computers, that's obviously played such a big part of it, mm. but. I think that we are on a course now where it isn't really about human interaction anymore and it's 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 almost a sort of like uh cyber darwinian society that we live in with the mask of uh civility mm. if you know what I mean yeah and I think that Mark embodies that like perfectly you see um I mean, don't get me wrong, I agree with you about Mark embodying that, that concept perfectly, but um, that's very interesting what you say to me about um, you go into shops and it, it, no matter the shop, you, you just aren't comfortable, you don't want to be there. If it were a yeah. shop selling, I don't know, something very, very niche that you enjoy, books or notebooks or stationery or something, well, I mean, that, that's me, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I, I, I like stationery. I go to, like, Ryman's, mm. go to water, Waterstones all the time. If I if I can, mm, but mm. but then I'd argue that like say Ryman and Waterstones, they're they're chain stores. Yeah. But if you went to a, a like um, you went into a stationery shop where they were selling pens, paper, notebook, whatever, and the guy behind the counter who you're going to give ten pounds to or whatever, if he owns the shop and he can say, yeah, we've just had these in this morning. It's um a new batch from um Lamy, the fountain pen company, or it's um. Whatever, and he's he's has this emotional connection with his products, which makes him want to be a better shopkeeper. I'd yeah. argue that that's a completely different thing to say going to Waterstones and looking at a notebook and thinking, yeah, that's nice, and then taking it to the counter. Because I think that yeah. is a dehumanising experience in a way. I mean, I don't, I don't, um, I think it, I think it's a, a sort of trap, no matter what way I look at it because I say oh I don't really feel okay. welcome but I know in my head that if I if I was made to feel welcome I would end up finding it tedious and and this is a it's a, it's you know it's not a very nice way to look at the world but I don't th- I, I don't think I'm alone on that and I think most people well maybe not most people but a, certainly a good few people today are not really 
interested in the sort of uh, old worldy sort of hi yeah how you doing what you been up to mm, if you know what mm. I mean and I know I what you mean it's yeah become, it's become more about I want that and I, I I'm going to buy it but I don't really want any sort of anything in between I'm here to buy that and that's it hmm I see what you mean. That's it. I just it's, it's sad. It's a very sad reality, but I think that's it's that's where we're heading. I think. I, I have to say I disagree. I think that we are with some things but we aren't with others if that makes sense. In that um say I needed, I don't know, something very mundane. If I needed mm-hmm. like my groceries or something. Because I know that I'm not going to go to a green grocer and then a butcher and then a, a farm yeah, to get some eggs. Because I know I'm not going to do that journey because that's been made redundant by the, the concept of the supermarket. Yeah. Because I know I'm just going to go to Tesco. What's stopping me from going online and and ordering those groceries? I wouldn't mind doing that. But if it's something that I not necessarily take pride in, but like um, like I'm a big coffee nerd. I get my I roast. I, well, I buy my beans directly from a roaster then I grind them and I brew them and all this sort of stuff and so for me the customer support and the contact with the roaster that I have yep. that means a lot to me in that process because I'm very interested in the chemistry and the minutiae of, of that and that's the same way I feel about like um, notebooks and things like that like I a long long time ago now I bought this bullet journal from an online like an online stationery store because I was sat in chemistry or whatever it was, and I thought, yeah, I need a notebook, and I just went online, bought one, and got it delivered. And then um, the next day, they sent me an email saying, yeah, sorry, we haven't got one in that colour, but we can put in a, put you in a different colour and all this. But um, the only way to describe it is the way that this email was worded. It was like, look, I'm really sorry, but um, you know, this is my business, so I'm going to do everything I can to be helpful and to be kind to you. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I think that's that that's the difference for me between getting mm-hmm. impersonal right well I need six eggs and five bananas and a block of cheddar and some bread and that's the groceries I need for what do you know what I mean it's the difference yeah. between that and saying yes well I want uh, I want a light roasted Costa Rican blend please do you know what I mean yeah there's a difference I mean, I in these th- things for me I suppose I suppose it, I, mean, I suppose everyone's an individual and everyone has their own sort of uh, experience yeah definitely definitely that. but I don't like even even when it's personalized like you know I just don't get the feeling that it's real mm, and mm. I just get the feeling that that anything that's personalized is sent straight from a sort of computer to sort of try and reel you in for more even if it's an actual person in an actual shop well well no no that I mean those niche shops that that you talk about um I I think that they're a different kettle of fish mm but l- like you said, they're niche, and I think that the m- the majority of companies today, you know, the the big ones are really only concerned with money, and like Mark, they'll put on any face that they need to, in order to try and get you to do what they want. Mm. It's like how Amazon's Amazon's business is. It's not. It's not the Kindle. It's not being an online selling platform. It's not being the bookshop that they originally were their business is being expandable yes. and being able to say right well iPads are big now for the next six months let's concentrate on making the Kindles and they're yeah. just going to crank out a million Kindles per week or whatever it is and sell them and that's their business is being expandable and being thirsty for cash Yeah, I mean they're so huge it's unbelievable how big Amazon is exactly yeah 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 and how can you continue? You can't continue to be personal at that level. Like you, if you, if you, I don't. Are, are there Amazon shops, like literally shops that you can go into, or is it just online? The only one I'm aware of is an Amazon bookshop, which is in New York, I think. Yeah. Because I think so, so really, that's the only one in the world, as far as I'm aware. Yeah. So you really don't have to go too many layers into it to to take away the human interaction. Yeah. And I think it's more common. Uh, I think it's becoming more common, anyway, with a lot of companies. Like with with supermarkets, you're getting these sort of uh, devices that you know beep for you. You know your self checkout. Mm, and, mm. and like at my Tesco, 
like at my Tesco, you have these this handheld self checkout, as it were. Like um, you go around the shop and you beep a tin of beans or whatever, and put it in your trolley. And then the idea, <laughs> I've literally gone through entire trips to Tesco and stuff, like just with my headphones on, not listening to anybody, not yeah. talking to anybody. It's like boop, okay, that's beans in the trolley. Boop, that's bread. Boop, that's whatever. And then get to the checkout and scan it, and then you that that's it. You do your entire visit completely without seeing anybody. Yeah. But then, do you and think that's a better situation? than, like I say, going to a baker, going to a greengrocer, going to a butcher? I don't... I, I don't know. Technology... Technology you can sort of, you know, take... give and take from it. Sure, and sure. And people... People that complain about those devices that, that self-check out for you are such liars. <laughs> and, like, they... They don't... I think that they... that they want them. Okay. And I think I think everyone wants them, because no one does anything if they complain. You, you know, you don't you don't write letters to Tesco saying I don't like that. I want to speak to someone. I want to sort of have a conversation with a real person. Yeah. And eventually, because it will be just so much easier soon to just put these things in rather than employ human beings. Mm. I think that that will end up heading that way, and no one will say anything. Or the people that do will be so small and quiet that nothing will be done. Perhaps we'll just sleep. We'll just sleepwalk into it without really complaining about it. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we'll complain about it, but the complaining that we do will be after the fact. Yes, exactly. Mm. We'll be like, "Oh, I hate those things." Right, I'm going to Tesco now to get my, you know, and it's like it's immaterial. Yeah. Right, well now we've had that nice cheery chat about the capitalistic march into uh, technocracy. <laughs> now we've had that nice lovely warm up. I've got a question for you. Do oh, you think it's question time. Yes, it's question time. Du -du -du -du. Uh do you think <laughs> Do you think Mark Zuckerberg has seen this film? Do you think he sits at home with his wife watching it going, Oh no, no I didn't do that. That's that's not how that happened. Well, Fiona, it's a good question that you've asked me. <laughs> and uh I th I think that he has seen it. Okay. But, I mean, when <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg is such a meme, isn't he? That's He's very like, true, especially after the the um, the trial not so long ago. Yeah, Senator, we run ads. It's yeah. Like <laughs> He's so he doesn't look human at all. He <laughs> just looks, and it, it maybe it's just a perfect. The, the the character study in the film. It's maybe it's just so reminiscent of how he actually is. Maybe Aaron Sorkin had a good uh, hour conversation with him, and he just went, "Oh my God, this guy isn't even real." Good this Lord, this, they've made an artificial <laughs> human without even realizing it. This guy's dead. This guy's Ava's cousin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, let's, let's make all the films we ever do. Let's make it just a long list of. of <laughs> We've got, we've got a theme. We've got a, yeah. an, an interconnecting theme. Which is just androids. Yeah. Yep, just emotionless arseholes. Yeah. That's, that's our theme. Yep. I mean, that's who I am in real life anyway. So it's, I mean, they say, <laughs> do what you know. So here I am. That's it. <laughs> I've got a question for you. Go on. So, like, do you know um, who David Fincher is? I know his name, and I am going to Google him now. <laughs> Yep. I know he directed this. Yeah, he directed this. He's directed... Oh, he did Fight Club. And yep. Gone Girl. He's oh, I like some of these films. <laughs> yep, he's simi He's like uh, the Aaron Sorkin of directing. Okay. Look, both of them are incredibly talented, hmm. but both of them are notoriously uncompromising <laughs> when it comes to uh, making films. Okay. Or TV shows or whatever. Um... See when see when Eduardo smashed the computer. Yes. F Fincher made him do that twenty seven times, I believe. Don't quote me, mm. but it was over twenty times that he made him do it, mm. and he just is an absolute perfectionist. So the question I want to ask you is. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you think it's ironic that two incredibly talented and uncompromising people? have joined together on a film about incredibly talented uncompromising people who cannot compromise um yeah I suppose it is ironic 
Thank you I mean, for your answer. J- just just uh, by the dictionary <laughs> definition, I'd say, that, yeah, that's ironic, technically speaking. I think um, I remember reading somewhere that, you know that, that bit in The Shining where Shelley Duval is is backing up the stairs and Jack Nicholson is coming up towards her and she's swinging the baseball bat to hit him with? Yep. They did that shot 147 times. Oh, uh, in, in 147 God. takes before he got that final one that he wanted, a Kubrick. Kubrick was an arsehole to her. Oh yeah, her hair was falling out from stress by the end of the film. Yeah, mm. and like he like wouldn't let her have breaks and was just so relentless mm. to try and get a sort of wearied out, um, weepy performance from it. I mean, her performance is absolutely fantastic. Mm. So. Mm. Uh, it definitely worked, but <laughs> <laughs> you know he got stuff done at the end of the day. That's the main thing, isn't it? Yeah, it's Shelley Duvall making a complaint to the producer or something, saying, "Look, he's making me really stressed out. My hair's falling out from stress. I'm really mad all the time. I just want to go home." And they yeah. said, "Yeah, but you know, you get stuff done. It's all for right. The greater good. It's for the greater, the greater good, good. It's for the greater good, my love. My my love." <laughs> the producer <laughs> was from the West Country. Yeah, the producer was was one of those guys from the round table in Hot Fuzz. The greater <laughs> good. I know that we're might be talking about the social network, but mm-hmm. do you know what annoys me? It annoys me that Stephen King said that that was a bad film. Um. Yes. Well, I don't. Is that what he said? Because I think the entire because having read the book and seen the film, the entire point of the book is that Jack gets possessed by the spirit of the hotel and slowly descends into this madness. And the the, yeah. the crux of the film is him running around the hotel like Jack Nicholson does in the film. Yeah. But from Jack Nicholson's performance, it's quite clear that Jack Torrance was completely mad right from the start. Yeah. So I think I can understand him saying because I remember I, I remember hearing somewhere that Stephen King was very against casting Jack Nicholson saying no do not cast Jack Nicholson because if you cast him he will play it as crazy to the whole film and that's not what I want yeah obviously Kubrick uh, disagreed yeah yeah I think I think that what his angle was was that he wanted it to be just scary yeah yeah rather than about the characters mm, mm. and there were, there was these fantastic moments where like, it would be light and nothing would be happening and like a ho- a horrific sound would would you know sort of chime and it, and I think that the, the reason he did those things was like because he wanted to simulate well there is no breath that you can take in this film mm, there is mm. not one single point where you can have a break from the horror because horror movies nowadays are so predictable and you know exactly when a jump scare or something terrifying is going to happen and mm. it just leaves you sort of you know deflated but there wasn't one more I, like I was when I first watched The Shining I was horrified throughout the entire film yeah I was constantly cold and chilly and just you know so uncomfortable watching it yeah I think um Yes, it's a deeply uncomfortable film, to say the very least. Yeah. I the... Go on. Uh, the most the most uncomfortable bit for me was when uh I think it might be I think it might be um Shelley Duval who looks into the room and it's a guy and the bear. Yeah, that was real weird. I was re- that really scared me when I was when I was younger because just the complete randomness of it. Mm, mm. I didn't know what it was. I had no idea what was going on when I saw it. I was like, what, did, what does that mean? Do you know what it means now? No. I, I do. It's, um, what is it, it's what a homage it to a similar scene in the book um, where there's this guy that previously owned the hotel who was um, dressed up as the dog. I th- oh, God. I mean, I've, this is a long time ago I read this book. But there's a guy who previously owned the hotel was dressed up as the dog. Yeah. And the man in the suit was the person who currently owned the hotel. At, not at the time the film was set, but many, many years before. They were like ghosts of the hotel. Yeah. And um, essentially it was just... The part in the book was just sort of a thing that Stephen King wrote to unsettle you. This weird party that Jack Torrance yeah. finds himself in, 
where everybody's in like dinner jackets and nice dresses and stuff and um then he looks over and one of the one of the party guests is in a like a fursuit it's uh, yep. that that's the function of it in the book i'm not sure what the function of it is in the film ah. because it doesn't fit with anything else it's never really quite i think it explained w- that th- they're ghosts of the hotel spirits of the hotel yeah i think it's horrifying it is yeah that's just that sh- mm. just that shot that guy just looking and, and the, they don't have any scary faces it's just the complete randomness and just it being so mm. out of place mm. is just absolutely yeah, definitely. shocking i think um it's horrific the reason it's so scary in the film is because it, it, uh, sorry in the book is because of the randomness as well in the sense of um they they make a point stephen king makes a point of describing how every single room in the hotel is completely full how all the guests have come back to haunt the hotel and they're all all the rooms are completely full so briefly yep. you're you're made aware of there's a couple of people in weird rooms and like one of them, one of the characters is running down a corridor and he like peeks into a door and sees something horrible and then from that point onwards you think well what the hell is going on in all the other rooms if that's just a, mm-hmm. a sample a random sample yeah so i think this podcast's going well we're talking about the social network and we've just done a review and, of the and, shining and, but, <laughs> Listen, I've got I've got a great segue back to the social. Oh, okay, I'm ready network. for this. Okay, yep, and and I think Philip oh, is going to tell good old it. Philip. Right, right, go on, Philip. What what what's what's the segue? Well, eh, right. So the hotel, right, because it's so like, full, right? As you were saying, like, full like a wee belly, mm-hmm. right? So it's full and. All the rooms have got like something different in it, and uh, that's sort of like uh, the internet. So uh, we're now back in the the social network because uh, it's, it's about the Staggering internet. And that. that was superb. And the, and the internet is full of stuff. Okay. Thank you, Philip. That was uh, most was enlightening. Fantastic. Yeah, I really um, enjoyed that. Right. Well, th- thank f- thank you for that seamless transition. <laughs> b- back to the social network. <laughs> okay. Um, have you got any um, other notes? I've got a couple of bits and bobs about like network. nice things that I saw in the film, like um, when he Go sits down to code face smash, face smash. No, face smash. Yeah, it's face smash. When he sits down to code face face smash. Face smash. When he sits down to code face smash. He um takes a separate keyboard out of his drawer that's like a mechanical key a little mechanical keyboard designed for coding and I would quite like one of those <laughs> so if IBM are listening or, or somebody that's got access to vintage mechanical keyboards hook me up um, and as uh, you alright Danny? <laughs> I I thought it was going to be some sort of deep uh, philosophical point, and he he brings out this uh, this nice wee keyboard, and um, and uh, I want one of them. So if uh, if anyone's listening listening that has one and is willing to just send me one, that'd be try and get me one. (laughs) But um, no, I did think it was a nice thing as well. It's um, I think that might have been something alluding to how he puts on a mask in it, like I was saying, in that um, he's put on this mask for his hand gloves that's the word for that he's put on gloves and he's doing this completely different thing as it were which is distinct from his yep. what you what you hope and presume his natural personality to be uh huh and um another nice kind of like well, he's kind of like a troll then yeah d- completely he is a troll yeah he's like he's like the, the first the first troll or the first uh version of a troll mm mm I think trolls are really interesting. Okay. And I'll tell you for why, right? Scottish people always say that. I'll tell you for why. And 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 the Welsh say it as well. Mm. And I'll tell you for why. Uh, yeah, um, I recognise it from Gavin and Stacey, <laughs> embarrassingly. Yeah, Bryn, Bryn says it. Bryn, um, what a guy. No, but I think that this, is, this isn't this is my idea, by the way. So, okay. But it's, it's a fantastic... Uh, it's from a video... By uh, counter arguments, okay, and he talks about um, the media talking about bigoted trolls, okay, 
and he points out that that is is uh, completely illogical because someone who's bigoted has uh, very specific prejudices and um, against a certain group of people. Okay. But a troll, a troll's sole purpose is to annoy and push people's buttons. So the term bigoted troll is completely nonsensical. Um, I suppose so. If you take those definitions, yeah. Yep. I think like the term it would it would make more if the the term bigoted troll kind of would make sense if. It, what's the word? If it was a very specific thing they were trolling about, if that makes sense. So if it was this very specific thing that they're bigoted about, if they were trolling about that specific thing, then I guess it kind of makes sense. Well, they wouldn't be a troll then. They'd just be a bigoted person. Trolling. Be, being being bigoted. I suppose so. Because like, people... Like, trolls, will ju- trolls will say anything to try and make people upset. Mm-hmm. And in that way, he he points out that they're almost like the sort of like the Joker in the Dark Knight, mm. that they have no identity, and they will say anything to try and push people to their breaking points. Sure, sure. Now Mark isn't a troll. Mark is a human being. And I'm not a number. I'm a free man. I am not a crook. That's a that's Nixon. I don't know where that came from. No, neither do I. I just, but you know. I just, Mark is a, a bit like Nixon, I, I guess. Uh, uh, this is another a very seamless, another seamless transition there. Um, something else that I've I quite liked in the film was that um, after Wado had closed that bank account, frozen all the assets so that he couldn't cash a check or whatever it was, mm-hmm. it was um, he, Mark calls him up and he's on the phone complaining, and while he's on the phone, Eduardo is literally extinguishing a dumpster fire. Yeah, he's literally got his fire extinguisher out and he's putting out this fire. It's like, it's 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 because it's a Sorkin film. It's like a very delicately done ham-fisted metaphor. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. If exactly. you saw it in an, in anything else, you think, well, that's dead ham-fisted. It's like yep. oh, somebody's just died and there are ravens flying overhead, or oh, it's a funeral <laughs> and it's raining. Do you yep. know? But it's it, it, in this film, it it fits perfectly. You don't question it at all. No. And and I and I haven't questioned it until you made me question it. Well, there we go. So we know that it worked. Thank you, thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Mister Sorkin. Or, yeah, thank you, thank you for that. Isn't Aaron a weird name? Um, no, it's spelt, no, it's, it's not spelt, that weird. It's spelt with two A's. Okay. So that Ah Ron. So it sounds as if someone's shouting to Ron. Hey, Ron. Ron! Yeah. Ah, Ron! As if Ron's killing someone. I mean, I suppose so. But I've never considered it. it it's, it's it's an old school name, isn't it? It's like it's a biblical name, I think, Aaron. So, I mean. Oh, God. Right, okay, Philip, get us back on track. Right, uh, so, like, the internet is like a. Uh, right, <laughs> yeah, huh? <laughs> <laughs> the internet is like you know you click on things and it takes you to places that you you, you didn't intend to go because like you just like clicking and stuff. I so now we're is that how you the use the internet, Danny or Philip or whoever? Well, you find well you know you you click on random things without even really thinking about it, and then you're all over the place, and then you realise oh wait my test is the Mora, and then your mum's angry and she kicks you out and all that. And but no, eh, and eh. <laughs> it's, uh, it's 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 really it takes you places you never thought you could go before, aye. So back to the social network. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible, yes, absolutely fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> this this one is like it really is like the internet because we've just clicked on random random to- topics we've talk- talked and about videos. The Shining we've, at one point. With we've, we've talked we've, about we've, everything apart from what we're meant to be talking about. <laughs> And yet, somehow, I've exhausted my notes. Yeah, well, we've we've slipped bits in there, you know. Mm, we've mm. slipped bits in there. Yeah. That's, yeah. Show it, sh- if you get, have you got anything else before we end up talking about <laughs> Before something we end up talking about, different. I don't know, the current political situation in Cambodia. No, I don't have <laughs> anything else. Well, so, to sum up, 
It's a great film. Mm. Aaron Sorkin's dialogue is what yeah. makes it amazing. David Fincher's directing is like a dozen glacé cherries on top of a delicious sundae. Justin Timberlake's acting is surprisingly good. Yes, it, considering he was like a pop star and then he went into yeah. acting, he's actually really good. I like know. he's good in this, and he was good in um, was it Friends with Benefits? That film he did with Mila Kunis, he was really good in that too. Oh, I never saw that film. Oh well, he was he was good. I'd recommend. Let it. me guess. Let me guess. It's friends who like hook up with each other, and then by the end they end up getting together. Yeah, but it's a bit more charming than that because they're both ah. quite charismatic, and it's like. What a what a completely complicated film. I won't be watching that, but uh, it'll be we'll we'll review that next week. <laughs> 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 this week we're talking about friends with benefits. Um, right. Shall we? Uh, what, how can what, what the how can the how can the woman who voiced Meg be charming? Um, you realise Meg is a character, right? It's like how Ron Swanson is separate and distinct from. From Nick Offerman. If she, if if I watch Friends with Benefits and I'm charmed, I think that Mila Kunis could possibly be the best actress on the planet. Um, because right. Meg is Meg is just not charming at all. I suppose not. She's kind of you endearing know. as an underdog. See, we're doing it again. We're talking about <laughs> something we shouldn't be talking about. <laughs> Come on, Philip, get us back in track. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm only joking. Philip's, Philip's really tired. His brain his brain has been exhausted. He's gone for a nice <laughs> nap. <laughs> no, it's a great it's a great character study. Mm, and, definitely. Uh, and it's it's definitely worth watching, I would mm. say. Um Right, I think it's is a is a suggestion. Right. I think next week or next time we record, whenever it might be, if it's not exactly a week from today, then that's okay. But I think next time we record, we should talk about Watchmen. Oh my god, Lewis. <laughs> the book and film combo. Lewis, why would you do that? Why okay. th- that is such no, a mammoth. Understandably, there is a lot to talk about. So I think, let's let's have some kind of crazy rule. Where was that right? Let's make, let's make ten notes in total each. Then that's all okay. we can talk about. We 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 can we can go off it and say, oh yeah, I thought this bit in 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 Watchmen was really similar to The Shining. Yeah, that's really interesting. We can do that if we really want to, <laughs> but let's let's condense it down. And I reckon we'll be alright. We're we're this we're this generation's prophets, Lewis. I mean, we probably shouldn't be. No, we that 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 is. I don't think I'm cut res- out for that job. No, that is too much responsibility for us. <laughs> What's that bit from Parks and Rec? Where he says, um, "Oh my God, this is so much responsibility. I have to find a way to get out of this." <laughs> No context needed. <laughs> yeah, it's actually it's uh, it's John Ralphio. He does something weird, and he's like, oh my god, so much responsibility. L- Lewis, it's Philip here. You're you're doing it again. Hi. Hi. Oh, I've got to get myself back on topic. You just you just woke me up, uh, and you're doing it again. Okay. All right. <laughs> he's really rude, isn't he? He's he just is quite rude. Wild. Yeah. He just he just jumped right in front of me and just shoved his massive nose on at my mic. There's a bit of snot on my mic now, by the way. Oh, that's nice. I like yeah. that. I like that. M- mossy green. Yeah. Good stuff. <laughs> right. right, so... Um, <laughs> so, are we doing Watchmen? Yes, we'll do let's Watchmen do Watchmen next, next week. week. If you haven't read Watchmen, if you haven't watched Watchmen, then do it, and next week yes. we'll talk about it, because yeah, I'm get- very excited. I'm. Th- I am, uh, Watchmen is my favourite book. Well, one of my favourite books. I think it's a really good film. I really like it. I, I, I enjoy the book and the film as well. I enjoy the book more than the film. Yes, definitely, definitely. Um, so Right, so, uh, anyway, where can people find you, Danny? On Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook? They can or just find by doing me, a Google search for Daniel Kerr? They can find me on Twitter, um, Kerso2000. I'm sure you already know how to spell that one. Yeah, we went through that in excruciating, agonising detail last time. Yep. Uh, on Instagram, uh, my Instagram name is at O'Hiram. And if you if you need spelling lessons, I do a podcast on spelling my username, which lasts for two hours and 45 minutes. <laughs> uh, and you can also find me, excitingly, on Facebook now. 
Oh, very nice. Just, just type in Daniel Kerr and you'll see me sitting on a chair looking solemn, <laughs> staring right into the camera and you'll know it's me <laughs> by that image. Well, i that's how I found you anyway. I walk into a room with you on your own and that's your default pose. Yeah, I do. You don't, naturally I don't do that. that facing pose. magnetic north, you naturally sit on a chair, twist until you're facing magnetic north, and look yep. morose. Yep, I'm doing that right now, by the way. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> <I'm doing> <laughs> um, you can Where find, can people find you, Lewis? Uh, people can find me on Instagram at Lewis underscore Brindley. People can find me on Twitter um, at Lewis Brindley4. Um, you can find our podcast at uh, shoutingintothevoid.podomatic.com. Share it, share it with the world. It's on Instagram. It's we're, our link is on Instagram. It's on Facebook. It's on Twitter. It's everywhere. Uh, share share the podcast link. We're on Spotify. We're on Apple Podcasts. Share it with the world. Yeah, or or like just just post us money so that we we don't have to keep <laughs> attempting to make <laughs> just so that we don't have to keep making content about things we don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's what it's going to be about it's us just making a podcast about what we don't understand but can you imagine, send money <laughs> can you imagine going going downstairs picking up the post and thinking oh that's um, that's my subscription to bird watching monthly or whatever it might be and then you flick that onto the side and then you look at an envelope a big chunky envelope and you think what the hell could be in this you open it and it's just a big stack of 50 pound notes <laughs> all it says is to Lewis Daniel and Philip at shouting into the void from Gary from Gloucester. Yeah, if you're listening, Gary from Gloucester, mail us some cash, please. Yeah, hurry up, man. Come on. We've, Come on now. We've already done one of these. We, can, we, can we just make three the lucky charm and call it a day? <laughs> <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. Let's just do three and <laughs> leave it at that. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> no, um, I've enjoyed this one. I mean, I've it, enjoyed it, this it, one too, yeah. It's very... It's very uh, informal this one which mm, is mm. which is what we're all about and yeah. uh, thank you so much for listening yes thank you for listening thank you for sharing thank you for everything thank you thank you thank you